Hello, welcome to the latest edition of 153greatfish.com. In today's episode, we're going to focus and look to what the goal of the church should be. So the question for the church or any organization is that we need to know what our objective is. What should we be focusing on? What should we be measuring? So in the case of the church, the question is, should we be trying to fill up the church pews each and every Sunday? Should we be counting uh, and tracking the number of baptisms and Holy Ghost infillings and trying to make those numbers go up? Is it that we want to ultimately build bigger church buildings and maybe it's the number of square feet that we have that's uh, a sign of our uh, success and that uh, we're trying to expand that physical footprint? Or maybe we just should have the best programs in the city. Well, we're not going to answer that uh, quite yet, but ultimately we're going to leave this question for you to consider. And let's really dive into, as the church, what is our objective? Jesus, which is who we should look to as the author and finisher of our faith, gives us what is commonly referred to as the Great Commission. This is really the mission uh, and the instructions that he gave to those disciples that choose to follow Jesus. So in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, Jesus says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Sum it up in three words. Jesus said, teach, baptize, teach. He told us, his disciples, that we should go, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular. There's only one name that fulfills the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and that is Jesus. There's much more on this website about that if you want to dive into it further. But that wasn't the end, right? Baptism is really only the beginning. Jesus continued to say, teaching them to observe all things. That's what we are commanded to do, to teach, baptize, and continue to teach after baptism. Some versions of the Bible take the first part of verse 19 and sum it up with the phrase, go make disciples. In 2016, Stan Gleason wrote an excellent book called Follow to Lead, The Journey of a Disciple Maker. If you haven't read this book, absolutely recommend it. Go out to Amazon uh, or PentecostalPublishing.com, get yourself a copy, read it, and apply it. I'm a firm believer if somebody has already done an excellent job uh, taking and writing about a particular topic, there's no point in trying to reinvent the wheel. So for the rest of this episode, let's read from the last part of chapter one, starting at the bottom of page 24. In the first century church, the expectation and the experience was that all born again believers did ministry. Originally, the word minister was a verb and not a noun. Somewhere, Christianity turned an action word into a title. The fivefold ministry, see Ephesians 4.11, provided leadership for the church, but ministry was shared by all. Saints were trusted to serve, and they were highly esteemed by their leaders. The apostles equipped, empowered, i.e. laid on hands and shared their authority, and released saints for the ministry. One example is the development of deacons in Acts 6. Notice what happened when the seven were identified, ordained, and commissioned. And the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. When the ministry was decentralized, and the saints were equipped, empowered, and released to do ministry, the results were explosive. It is a wonderful thing when the saints believe in the pastor, but is it even more wonderful when the pastor believes in the saints? The historic church does not have a legacy of leadership that believed in and empowered church members for ministry. 
For most of church history, there was a gap between ministerial professionals, the educated clergy, and parishioners, mostly uneducated, mostly theologically uneducated laity. Peter and John would have never been respected spiritual leaders, much less apostles, in the historic church. Their trained antagonists referred to them as unlearned and ignorant men. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. The clergy were the interpreters of scripture. They told the laity what the scripture said, what it meant, and what they should think about it. Some churches today may not specifically use these terms, but they function somewhat similarly. The church members do not think for themselves. Neither are they allowed to make simple decisions without consulting their pastor. The pastor may tell members if and when they can take vacations, how they should spend their money beyond biblical stewardship, and what color of carpet to install in their homes. This style of pastoring does not trust the laity to do any ministry except to clean the church or cut the grass. This kind of leadership will stunt spiritual and numerical growth. Jesus did not intend for his command to go make disciples of all nations to be fulfilled only by the five-fold ministry or the so-called professional clergy. This was a commission for every believer to embrace. In fact, Acts chapter 8 presents a paradigm shift in fulfilling Christ's vision. Following the death of Stephen, intense persecution came against the church. The last phrase of verse 1 says, And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. It appears that this persecution served as the catalyst to launch the gospel beyond the city limits of Jerusalem. The narrative states that the apostles remained in Jerusalem while other believers suddenly became refugees and were randomly dispersed throughout many communities of the region. One might say this effort was launched through the tyranny of the urgent, like the World War II fighter pilot who said he made his first parachute jump when his plane was shot down. Saul continued to persecute the Christians, which further dispersed them to far-reaching areas. Then verse 4 makes a startling statement that perhaps would upset the theological apple cart of some today. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So if the apostles remained in Jerusalem, and it was the church members who were scattered during this persecution, then it appears that the ones who went everywhere preaching the word were the saints. Apparently, these non-licensed but obedient saints were qualified and empowered by the apostles to take what they had been taught and repeat it to everyone who would listen. The privilege and responsibility of preaching, communicating, the word, does not belong to the fivefold ministry alone. Saints may not be called preachers, but they may take in what they hear on Sunday and from pastoral Bible studies and carry it outside of the four walls of the worship center, rehearsing it to anyone who will listen. I would venture an educated guess that the overwhelming majority of ministry that takes place in most of our worship centers occurs within the walls of the worship center or on campus. Yet the model we have been presented with is for the saints to go everywhere throughout the week preaching the word. Too much ministry is being done by the church for the church. We continually carry the water to the river instead of to the desert. In the beginning, it was not so. Most of the ministry in the first century was done beyond the walls. In fact, the first dedicated Christian edifice was not built until the third century. However, the lack of a regular worship space did not seem to hinder the spread of Christianity. What would happen in the apostolic church today if everyone did the work of the ministry and the majority of ministry occurred beyond the walls of the worship center? It is no mystery why a local congregation 
will grow proportionally to the percentage of ministry that is done by the saints beyond the walls of the sanctuary. Those early believers did not have buildings to focus their lifestyle around. They did not see themselves as people who went to church. They believed they were the church everywhere they went. For them, church was not a destination, but a journey. For them, church was not a facility, but an action. They did more church in streets and in homes than they did in sanctuaries. Where did they get this model? Clearly, their example was Jesus. They had watched him work far more miracles and do more ministry in the streets, in the fields, at the lake, and in the homes than he did in the synagogue or temple. We must not put all of our ministry eggs in one basket called Sunday. According to Acts 2 and verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. There is only one possible explanation as to for why they were able to enjoy daily conversions. A few verses earlier it says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. The Lord could add daily because the first century church was a daily church. Not very many of our local churches have reached the activity level of being a daily church, but when we do, the Lord will begin adding daily to the church. I constantly remind our local church that what happens Monday through Saturday is more important than what happens on Sunday. If we are not doing what we have been called and commissioned to do the other days of the week, then Sunday has a different purpose. When Sunday is the only ministry day of the week, it becomes a pep rally or motivational meeting where everyone gets propped up so they can go back out into the world and do nothing purposeful to build the kingdom of God. In a way, it's like ordering at the counter of a fast food restaurant. Before you place your order, they want to know, is this for here or to go? And when we come to church, most people order for here and don't get it to go. But Jesus' vision was, get it to go. If we are doing the work of the ministry and making disciples Monday through Saturday, then Sunday will not be a therapy session for codependent saints. Sunday will become a celebration of thanksgiving for all the great things that God is doing through his people to fulfill his mission. Nothing will excite a congregation like sharing real life stories about making disciples and seeing lives dramatically changed. If we get our theology right and do what we should be doing Monday through Saturday, then Sunday will be an important part of an entire life of worship. Well, I obviously could not have said it much better myself. So let's go and let that sink in. Let's let it marinate in our hearts and in our minds. And look to this question again and ask ourselves as the church, what is our objective? Join us next time here at 153greatfish.com and we will continue to explore this topic. God bless. And this baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. Shout it just one time. And the very air trembles with the power and the presence of a living God.